Welcome everyone. Um, last lecture, bioinformatics, um, the summary. So if you've not watched any of the previous videos, this is going to be the video for you because I'm going to summarize everything in like two hours. Um, so it's going to be good. It's going to be good. So last stream, last stream, I'm, it's like puppy eyes. It's such a shame, such a shame. It's not going to be the last stream because the next um, lecture series is going to be online as well. Um, I hope so. I hope so. It might be that actually the university will force me to do it in person. Um, but we'll have to see. We'll have to see. But I'm, I'm very sad about it. Like I like the like weekly being here and, and talking to myself and uh, reading chat and answering questions and these kinds of things. But um, it's really a shame that um, we're done with this series. So, but you guys had 14 good lectures, um, and uh, I hope everyone does really well on the exam, so that, uh, that that we don't have to have a makeup exam or something like that. Anyway, this is going to be the overview, right? So the overview is just going to be me talking through all of the lectures, and then all the way at the end, I have four um, example exam questions. They're actually not example exam questions. They're actually real exam questions from previous years. Um, so uh, just so that you guys get a feeling of what kind of questions I, I ask and how I ask them, um, and I will be answering them, so then you can see what I think is uh, important. Um, but with that out of the way, uh, let's start with uh, lecture one, the introduction. Um, so in the introduction, we talked a lot about what bioinformatics is, right? Like bioinformatics is a discipline that uses tools from computer science to answer biological questions. And then I also gave you guys a whole bunch of this kind of um, definitions. Um, but the thing is that if I would ask a question like, what is bioinformatics, right? Then I want you guys to at least mention computer science and biological questions, right? Because those are the two core elements in the, in the definition. So you can write it down any way that you want, as long as it mentions computer science or um, information technology or some kind of uh, analogy for that. Um, and of course, the biological questions need to be in there as well. So that's kind of the way that I kind of do the slides, right? Many of the slides, they have this kind of blue highlight um, in definitions, and that, that's the important part. So for lecture one, know what an algorithm is, know what, a, know what data is, know what knowledge is, know the difference between data and knowledge, and also know the difference uh, between like in vivo, in vitro, and in silico, because those things are, are pretty important for bioinformatics. Um, we also talked about DNA sequence, right? That sequence is the fundamental data type in bioinformatics. That, that's the thing that started it all, right? So we started doing like protein sequencing and DNA and RNA sequencing at a certain point, and that's where the whole field of bioinformatics comes from. Um, yeah, so DNA, RNA, and protein su sequences are more or less the, the, the reasons why the field of bioinformatics exists, because yeah, people needed to store it in databases and then you need to analyze it. Um, and know that sequence is also the entry point for many in silico studies, right? Um, if we think about the current coronavirus situation, then it all started with people sequencing the virus, figuring out that it's a Sarbacov, and then making like phylogenetic trees and tracking how um, the, the virus um, mutates across the world and spreads across the world. And uh, know what whole genome shotgun sequencing is, um, and also know that sequence alignment is one of the most fundamental algorithms in bioinformatics. So and, uh, the alignment of two sequences against each other, um, and we spend a whole lecture on that. So we also went quite quickly through the microarray workflow in lecture one. Um, so and know at which point you don't have to be able to reproduce the whole thing right like i don't expect for you to like know point by point by point what the microarray workflow is um, but i want to be able to ask a question like um, in which parts of microarray analysis is a bioinformatician involved Right? And then you could say, well, a bioinformatician is involved in creating the arrays, um, but also in data storage, data normalization. And, and generally, I will ask something like, um, give me uh, four steps or four things or three things, right? So, all right, then lecture number two, phenotypes. So phenotypes, we talked about qualitative properties and quantitative properties. So uh, qualitative is something that is... Um, 
something like um, it tastes good, it smells bad, um, I don't like it, or I do like it, right? So it's something that you it, it, that is really hard to kind of put a number on, so and not measured with numerical results. And then we have quantitative properties, um, and, and quantitative properties that are properties that exist with a magnitude or multitude, um, which means that they can be measured using SI units. Um, and we talked also about Mendelian traits and complex phenotypes. Um, so Mendelian traits are uh, traits which are caused by a single gene which causes the difference in a phenotype. While complex phenotypes are phenotypes which are controlled by many genes. Um, so one example of a Mendelian trait is earwax. Um, there's dry earwax and there's wet earwax and there's a single gene in the genome that controls if you have dry or wet earwax, right? So it's a single mutation in, in a single gene. Uh, complex phenotypes are things like uh, human height, um, intelligence and all of these things, right? That's determined by many, many different genes. Uh, we also talked about like this mixing flowers thing. Um, so um, if a phenotype is additive, right? So if the genetics underneath the phenotype is additive, then you get mixing. Um, so that means that when we have a red, um, a, a red flower and a, and a white flower, right? So these are the gametes, um, then head you get this following Mendelian inheritance diagram, um, while if we have dominance, right, so one of the phenotypes dominate, um, then we get a different proportion, and this is because one of the two, they, they can't mix together. Um, so if you have a red allele, uh, you will always be red. Also be able to read these kind of diagrams. So um, yeah, I, I might ask a, a question about a diagram, so I will show you a diagram and then ask you, is this a additive or a dominant phenotype. Furthermore, we talked about the concept of linkage, right? So because genes are located on a chromosome, um, yeah, the closer they are together, the more often they are inherited together. So if they are very far apart, then there's a high chance that these two phenotypes, there will be a recombination um, in between. So a homologous recombination when the gametes are produced, separating the two phenotypes from each other. Um, and so linkage is a very difficult concept and I just want you guys to kind of be able to tell me in your own words um, what linkage is. Um, and we also talked about uh, two-point and three-point crosses which are very much the same, um, yeah, but you, these are used to determine if genes are linked or if they're independent, right? So if they are on the same chromosome and how close they are on a chromosome and then we have independent which means that gene 1 is on chromosome 1 and gene 2 is on a different chromosome for example chromosome 11. And the advantage of using a, th a three-point cross compared to a two-point cross is that in a three-point cross you can also infer the order of the chromosome. Right, so it allows you to kind of build a, a genetic map where you can say, well, if we start at the beginning of chromosome one, uh, then we first see the phenotype for, for example, broken wings, and then we see the, the a phenotype for eyes, and then we see a phenotype for antenna. Right, so we can determine the order of the genes on the genome, um, and that is only possible when we use a three-point cross um, because we can kind of figure out if A is closer to B than it is to C and these kinds of things. Good. Um, we talked a little bit about phenotypes in lecture two as well. So we talked about visual and analysis like um, box plots and histograms. Um, so be able to kind of tell me things about big box plots or histograms, right? So uh, a, a box plot generally shows the median value um, and then it shows the, uh, the quantiles, right? So 50% of the data and then 95% uh, of the data generally in the vexes. Um, and then we have like things like uh, histograms that we talked about, but they're probably really be a question about that. Um, we talked about multiple testing, so definitely know the difference between a type 1 and a type 2 error. And we also talked about descriptive statistics, right? What is an outlier and how to deal with outliers? So you can you can windsorize them away. Um, yeah, generally outliers are values which are very, very far apart from the distribution. And they can be caused by things like comma failures where you write down the comma wrong. Yeah, so instead of writing 3.0, um, you write uh, 30.0, right? So these kinds of things happen. 
Um, we also talked about things like exploratory data analysis and uh, to decide which model to use on the data a little bit. Yeah, so if you have a really nice normal distribution and of course you want to go with parametric statistics um, but if you have like a lot of outliers in your data then it's probably better to switch to non-parametric statistics um, and a little bit about hypothesis testing so good and then in lecture three we talked about DNA right so we talked that DNA is used for diagnostics uh, it lo used a lot in biotechnology and forensic biology and in virology right so DNA is used to catch criminals uh, find things like do you have the BRCA gene and have do you have a high chance of developing breast cancer and these kinds of things um, but also DNA and DNA research is used a lot in biotechnology right if we want to make like um, algae produce fuel um, then also we we look at the DNA of these algae and try to optimize them for producing biofuels um, virology I think that speaks for itself so we also talked about the old, more or less classical ways of sequencing DNA data, right? So, and we talked about Maxim Gilbert sequencing, Pyro sequencing, Sanger sequencing, and next generation sequencing. And what I want from you guys is that you are able to read these kinds of uh, plots, right? So here you see a plot, which is a Maxim Gilbert, uh, no, this is a, a Pyro sequencing? Yeah, I think this is pyro sequencing. And so you add the nucleotides in order, and then have when the nucleotide gets incorporated, uh, you see a little flash of light. Um, and the height of the of the flash determines how many base pairs there were. Um, but hey, if if I would show you a figure like this, and I would say to you guys, like, this is the order in which the nucleotides are added, then I want you guys to be able to say, okay, so this is then the resulting sequence. Um, the same thing for this. Um, so Maxim Guibert sequencing, where you uh, where you use like um, um, uh, you, where you use uh, kind of cutting enzymes which cleave at different points. So you have four different cutting enzymes: one which cuts at A plus G, one which cuts at a G, one which cuts at a G, and one which cuts at a C plus T, which causes to uh, which causes the DNA to fragment, right? And then these fragments are brought up on the gel. And then one of the things that I saw a lot in recent years when we did the exam is that people actually read it the wrong way around. So the sequence here you read from from the bottom to the top, right? Because um, um, here we see that it's C T A C G T A, um, and here you see C T A. So hey, you don't read it, and that's that's what go, often goes wrong. So people are able to kind of figure out which base pair there was at each of the different positions, um, but of course the first position is the lowest one because the cutting enzyme cuts um, at a certain point, right? So the smallest fragment is the is the is the is the first base pair. Um, so remember that when you see a sequencing gel um, with Maxim Gilbert sequencing, you have to read it from the bottom to the top. And that, that goes wrong a lot. So that's a tip for you guys. We talked also about the workflow for next generation sequencing, hey, that you do sample preparation, then you do DNA sequencing. Generally, um, as a bioinformatician, you're not involved in that. Sample preparation is done by a postdoc or by a PhD or by a master's student in the lab. Uh, the DNA sequencing is generally done by an external company because like at academia, we almost never do our own sequencing. Um, but of course, have what you get from the company is these fast Q files. Um, and then we need to do all kinds of steps um, before we can end up with a list of our single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so here we need to trim the reads, which means get rid of the um, ends because this, the quality of sequencing drops. So the more base pairs I sequence, the lower my confidence in that the base pair is actually correctly sequenced. Um, so here at a certain point we decided, or in the workflow you have read trimming where you say, well, I have my read, my read is 150 base pairs long, um, but I see that the quality after like 110 drops off. So then I'm just going to cut the read there and I'm going to ignore the last 40 base pairs. Um, so the read trimming again yields a fast Q file, same format as we had. Um, and then we do alignment and alignment is just al taking the read, scanning across the genome, see where it fits. Um, and then here you get a BUM file, which is this um, kind of file format used for um, for 
next generation sequencing data, um, which is similar to the sum, but then binary. Um, but it, it, after alignment, we have to handle duplicates um, because in the sequencing process, we have uh, generally a PCR step when we do our sample preparation, um, but also we have optical duplicates, which are caused by how the machine works. Um, so uh, we have to remove duplicates, which means that if we have a read, which is starting at a certain position, ending at a certain position, but we see the same read over and over and over and over again, um, then we, we, we just ignore all the duplicates and we just say, no, we had one read at this position instead of having like a hundred or a thousand, right? So these optical duplicates are very um, common. So you have to remove those. Um, then the next step is indel realignment. Um, so indel realignment means that you use known variation in the genome, right? We've already sequenced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of humans, probably more in the order of hundreds of thousands of humans by now. Um, so if we do an alignment of a read towards the human reference genome, then of course it might be that inside of where the read fits, that there is a variant, right? So um, a variant means that there's a single base pair which is different in some individuals, um, but that means that we don't want to penalize the alignment for having this variant. Um, so that's what indel recalibration does. Um, hey, it looks at little insertions and known deletions and then says, well, I'm not going to penalize the read for this because this is a known variant in the human genome. And of course, we don't have it just for humans, but also for mice and rats um, and other model organisms. Um, and then we have the base recalibration step. So the base recalibration step is very similar to the indel recalibration step um, or the indel realignment step. But the base recalibration step is just looking at single nucleotide polymorphism. Right, so um, it, it, the indels are for kind of short deletions and insertions, and the base recalibration is the same thing, but now for, for single base pair variants. And then in the end, generally what we do with DNA data is we don't look at the whole genome that we have, um, but ha imagine that we have a human, then we kind of want to summarize where the human is different from the reference sequence, um, so we then do single nucleotide polymorphism calling or SNP and indel calling um, to find the regions or the yeah the positions in the genome where our sample is different from the reference. So also know that there are drawbacks about doing next generation sequencing, right? That you need a lot of computing time. Um, it's getting better and better because tools become better and better, of course. Um, but in the end, um, there's a lot of computational time involved in doing the analysis of DNA sec data. You need a lot of hard drive storage, you need a lot of random access memory, and you need management of files. So you, hey, you need to keep track of all of these different files that are being produced. Hey, because of course, in the whole pipeline, hey, we start off with one file we get from the company, which turns into two files, three files, four, five, for six, seven, so it's like seven, eight files that you have in the end. Um, and you need to manage those and those need to be stored and you have to have backups and these kinds of things. Also know that there's a difference in the definition of what a gene is, right? In the previous lecture, so in the lecture when we talk about genes um, or as, as in phenotypes, right? So units of inheritance, um, but in molecular biology and in sequencing, a gene is not a unit of inheritance. A gene is a union of genomic sequences encoding a coherent set of potentially overlapping functional products, right? Because a gene nowadays in biochemistry or in, 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 in uh, molecular biology, uh, we see a gene as having introns and exons and hey, a single gene can produce different proteins or different variants of the same protein. Um, hey, so it's a much more complex definition in molecular biology than it is when we talk about genetics. In genetics, a gene is very basically a unit of inheritance. So generally it comes in two forms. Um, you have a red gene and a white gene, and hey, you get one of the gametes from your father, one of them from your mother, and these mix. But of course in molecular biology, stuff becomes much more complicated um, hey, because you have a, a gene which encodes color, and this color gene can have like 10 different variants, right? Some of them are white, some of them are red, some of them are purple, some of them are blue, hey, and all of these things can mix and match in an additive or in a dominant way with each other. Um, so in molecular biology, um, a gene is, is a very um, 
and it's a fixed definition and and it it's a it's a very it's a very good definition um, but it's a different definition than than what we use in genetics so be aware of that we also talked about transposable elements there will definitely be a question about transposable elements um, remember that they are uh, that they were first described or they were discovered by Barbara McClintock um, one of my favorite molecular biologists ever so there might be a question about that um, but when we talk about transposable elements so also called jumping genes uh, they come into two different classes so you have retrotransposons and DNA transposons so the retrotransposons they have an intermediate RNA form um, so they are more or less in the DNA they, they get more or less um, transcribed into RNA the RNA gets then built in into the DNA as well and the class 2 transposons are DNA transposons so they don't have this intermediate form and then every one of these classes is subdivided in two. So you have anonym, uh, autonomous retrotransposons and you have autonomous DNA transposons. And autonomous means that they don't need anything to move. So everything that they need to move from one position in the genome to another or to copy themselves from one position to another, um, they carry with them. Um, Non-autonomous means that um, it needs something from the host cell to move from one position to the other one. Right, so it means that not all of the proteins that it needs to jump around are encoded on the transposable element themselves. Um, we also talked a lot about different regulatory elements, so just read through them and know that there are different types of regulatory elements like insulators, um, enhancers, um, you have tata boxes and, and you have like um, metal sensing elements in the DNA. Um, but I'm not going to ask in too much detail about that. I think that the transposable elements, I like them much more, so there, there's more likely to be a question about transposable elements than there is about regulatory elements. Um, and also know the difference between a mitochondria and a chloroplast, know their function. Yeah, so the mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell, which means that they produce ATP. Um, chloroplasts are the same thing, they are also the powerhouse of the cell, but then in plants. Right, so they, they do photosynthesis and produce ATP for the plant that way. Lecture four, RNA. So I think this is generally the most boring lecture for everyone. Um, also for me, um, because there are so many different like types of RNA. Right, so you have messenger RNA, which comes in pre-messenger RNA called HNRNA, and then you have the mature messenger RNA called mRNA. We have transfer RNAs, which transfer amino acids, um, so they form the the link between the the messenger RNA sequence and the protein sequence by by having um, well, on one side they have the codon, and on the other side. On one side, they have the anticodon, right, which matches the messenger RNA, and then you have the amino acid, which is attached to it in a clover leaf system. You have ribosomal RNA, um, which is RNA inside of the ribosomes, which helps the ribosome be able to produce proteins. We have small nuclear RNAs, which are in the, the nucleosomes in the in the nucleus, um, which do things like splicing. Uh, we have catalytic RNAs, like ribozymes, which have a function themselves so it's have proteins generally have a biological function but catalytic RNA like ribozymes they also have a, a catalytic function so they are involved in biological processes we have microRNAs which are there to do regulation of, of gene expression so had they generally are binding messenger RNA which then gets degraded because the cell doesn't like double-stranded RNA. Um, we have small interfering RNAs which is kind of a micro RNA which is brought into the cell by humans um, or by microinjection. Um, and we have non-coding RNA which is actually RNA which does not code for a protein um, but we don't know exactly what it does, right? So generally it's like the it's like the micro RNAs but then much longer. So long non-coding RNAs or NC RNAs. So there are a lot of different types of RNA, a lot of different types of definition. I don't really like to ask very specific questions about it, um, but I do think that it's important that you know that like RNA is divided into all kinds of different subgroups. Um, 
again, the workflow for um, RNA sequencing is the same as for DNA sequencing. The only big difference is, is that you acquire your samples, you extract the RNA instead of extracting the DNA. And there is this additional step where you do RNA to DNA reverse transcription. And of course, in the end, because we do RNA sec, we're not in. Uh, we're generally not interested in the SNPs, so the variations in the genome. We are generally want to do the uh, extraction of the expression levels at the end, right? So instead of um, saying that, well, at this position, uh, my sample is different from the reference genome. In this case, what you are going to do is say, well, um, I look at my gene of interest and I count the number of reads that are there, and then I'm going to take the number of reads in sample one and compare them to the number of reads in sample two to see if there's a difference in expression level. Um, so had the goal of RNA-seq is different from the goal of DNA sequencing in that you want to get the expression of the genome, so the expression of the different genes in the genome, um, while generally in DNA sequencing you want to look for variations in the genome. We also looked at tools to predict secondary structure of RNA, right? So generally you take the sequence, you annotate uh, groups of secondary structures, and then this is all based on the lowest free energy structure, right? So it, it tries to fold the RNA in such a way that there's the least stress on the molecule. Um, so hey, we have things like RNA fold, which I think we had an example of, um, but there's also context fold and RNA shapes, and there's a lot of different tools. Um, in the RNA lecture, we also said that if you look at these um, short RNAs or if you look at these um, long non-coding RNAs, right, they generally have like this modular structure, which means that um, there's, hey, if you have a long RNA molecule, then part of it can, for example, bind RNA or DNA. Um, part of it can bind proteins, um, but also parts of RNA can be conformational switches. And these things, they are build up modular, right? So you can have a, a long non-coding RNA, which has two conformational switches and a protein binding domain. Um, or you have a long non-coding RNA, which has a DNA binding domain, a conformational switch, and then an RNA binding domain. So, and based on, on which which kind of structures we find in the RNA, uh, we can kind of figure out what the function of this RNA is, right? If an RNA has a protein binding domain, right, a piece of the RNA is predicted to bind the protein, uh, then of course we can kind of infer that this RNA has something to do with, with proteins. So, um, But then it's a modular structure. So these long non-coding RNAs, they, they are modular. So they're built up of different modules, which are more or less mixed and matched together. All right, so in lecture five, we talked about proteins. Um, so here we have some nomenclature, right, uh, which I want you guys to know. So uh, an amino acid is a single building block. Uh, we have a polypeptide, which is a chain of several amino acids. Um, then we talk about an apoprotein, which is one or more polypeptides, but not having the cofactor. Um, so for example, the zinc molecule that is needed to bind the thing that it needs to bind or the iron molecule to bind oxygen when we think about hemoglobin um, and then when we talk about proteins right then we talk about apoproteins with cofactors right so um, hemoglobin is a protein and then when we say the hemoglobin protein we mean the four chains or the eight chains of hemoglobin i think it has four so it has four chains, so it has four apoproteins, so four of these uh, polypeptides. And then within these polypeptides, you have um, iron molecules which bind oxygen, right? And then we talk about a protein. So we also talked about chirality, right? So the fact that um, if you have an amino acid, right, then almost all amino acids have are chiral, right? Because this molecule in 3D, right, cannot be... Um, put on top of this, right? It's the mirror image, right? That is what chirality means, that you, you have a molecule and then you have the mirror image of the molecule and these two, although they have the same structural formula, they do not have the same 3D structure. And because of that, you can have uh, one of them being very toxic and the other one being very beneficial, right? So uh, we also talked about that in nature, most of the amino acids are found in the left form, so the L form, um, and the D form is generally not seen or 
it, it's generally not produced. Um, but this, the chirality itself in proteins becomes a big issue when you do like um, chemical synthesis of, um, of, of medication, right? Because when you do chemical synthesis, uh, the chirality is um, egal, right? Because we don't care about the chirality or the, the, the process, the, the chemical process that we use um, uses um, like A plus B is C, right? But when C is produced, it's produced in both forms. Um, so hey, when you talk about amino acids, remember that they are chiral. Also remember that there is one amino acid which is not chiral, and that is glycine, because glycine has an H as the R group, right? The R group is the kind of side chain which determines which amino acid we're looking at. And of course, when R is an H, then we are able to turn the molecule in such a way that we, we end up with the mirror image. So glycine, the smallest one, so when the the side chain is just a single hydrogen molecule, um, then it is not chiral. Um, you can draw it and then try to uh, try to do it. Um, there's also these boxes actually. Um, so you have these um, snappy atoms, snapums or something like that they're called, and there you can just build um, these amino acids, right? So you have C molecules and you can stick in the things. Um, so if you if you are interested in chirality and stuff, then then pick up one of these boxes of snap snapums or snap atoms. I don't know exactly what they're called. Um, but then you can you can build these atoms yourself, which is really fun. So when we talked about proteins, we talked about the fact that you have the primary sequence. So the primary structure is just the um, amino acids in a row, right? So you have uh, glycine, valine, valine, leucine, isoleucine. Um, so when we talk about the secondary structure, the secondary structure um, and the primary structure, of course, and this is what I pointed out in the lecture, um, is based, so the primary structure of proteins is based on atomic bonds. And because of the fact that some amino acids actually are able to form sulfur bonds, you can have primary structures which are not just a single line of more or less letters. Right, you, uh, I showed you guys, I think, um, I showed you in the lecture two or three more or less complex primary structures where you have two polypeptide chains which are connected together by a sulfur-sulfur bond um, because of the, f and, and that, is, that is the difficulty in primary structures for proteins is that unlike DNA and RNA, which is just a single more or less straight line of letters, um, in proteins the primary structure has already other um, interactions. And, and so primary structure is based on atomic bonding, secondary structure is based on um, hydrogen uh, bridging, Right. Um, so, um, and then we have the tertiary and the quaternary structure. So the tertiary structure is based on all, more or less all forces working on it, and quaternary just means that we take the whole protein. So the different um, polypeptides. Know that there are different computational tools to predict protein structure. So there's up initial prediction where you just take the primary sequence and then try to predict secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure. Um, but we also have dedicated tools for st secondary structure prediction um, because that is more or less something that we can do very well. But from the primary structure determining the tertiary structure is really hard. Um, there's really good tools out there which can actually predict if there will be an alpha helix and if this alpha helix will be go through a membrane um, because these things are very um, are very common right so we know exactly how transmembrane alpha helices look like uh, there's thread and fold recognition and homology modeling um, so and know that there are five different more or less um, schools of thought about how to predict secondary, tertiary and quaternary structure of proteins from primary structure. Um, we also talked about the new alpha fold from Google, um, which is kind of using machine learning to do it. Um, but again, machine learning is just a field of homology modeling, right? Because machines, they, they look at all kinds of examples and then they learn how a protein folds based on the examples. Um, but that, of course, is kind of a type of homology because learning from an example means that you use homology 
We also talked about how you can separate proteins, right? So um, had, there's 2D gel electrophoresis, which allows us to separate protein mixtures, um, and we separate using two different methods. So the, the standard method is used for the y-axis or the, the, the y component of the gel, right? So that's the same for RNA gels, DNA gels, and, and protein gels. And so here we separate based on size using an electric charge. And then in the other um, axis, so on the x-axis, uh, we separate using a pH grade so we start off with a very low pH, low pH of like 2, and then we end up here with a high pH of like uh, 14, right? So water is like 7, so in the middle. Yep. So every protein comes with a charge, and that is because they have side chains. And these side chains, they give this protein an intrinsic charge, which means that a protein which has a positive charge feels more at home in a negative environment. Right? And a negative environment means that you have um, an, an abundance of hydrogen, um, so that means that you are then in a positive pH. But I could be wrong. Right? But had this, this second axis is based on the isoelectric point, and the isoelectric point from a protein or uh, an, a protein isoelectric point is made because of the fact um, that the protein has side chains. We also talked about orthologs, paralogs, in paralogs, out paralogs, senalogs, and I want you guys to kind of know what it is. Um, and I, I, I hope I explained it well, um, but it was at the end of the lecture after like a two and a half hour stream. So if I didn't explain it properly um, in, the, in, in the lectures, um, then do look it up online. Um, because it is important, there will definitely be a question about um, what is the difference between an orthologue and a paralogue, right? So, and this has to do with the gene duplication events and speciation events. And so when a species splits into two species or when a gene duplicates itself across the genome. Um, and I hope I explained it well during the lecture, um, but um, if I didn't, then um, please look it up because like, I can't explain everything perfectly because if I've been streaming for two and a half hours, then sometimes the, the quality of my thinking goes down. Uh, and besides that, we have, of course, xenologs. So xenologs are more or less pieces of DNA or proteins which are transferred from one species to another. Right, so it's a horizontal gene transfer mechanism, and we, we talked about like four of them, and one of them, of course, is just cloning or genetic engineering of bacteria, um, but bacteria also exchange DNA with, with other bacteria. So they make these little tubes, and then they just exchange parts of their DNA with each other to um, increase survival for both of them. All right, lecture six was about metabolites, so we talked about endogenous and ex endogenous metabolites and exogenous metabolites um, has so um, know the difference between the two. Uh, we also talked about primary metabolites and secondary metabolites. So primary metabolites mean that if you don't have them, you more or less die instantly, while secondary metabolites are metabolites which um, you can go without. Um, so. We also talked a lot about the mass spectrometry workflow. So mass spectrometry is four different steps. Um, the first step is compound separation, which can be done using three different techniques. Um, two of them, which are chromatography techniques, either using a liquid or a gas as the mobile phase. And then we also have capillary electrophoresis, which again is very similar um, to how we separate proteins and how we separate DNA by their size. Um, but here we use electrophoresis is using a very narrow capillar um, and in the capillar we kind of break down uh, or we, 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 we slow down big proteins because they are big and, and small proteins go through relatively quickly. So after we've done the compound separation in mass spectrometry, we go to fragmentation and ionization, which means that the, the, the protein that or metabolite that we're looking at gets fragmented into little pieces, and then each of these little pieces gets ionized, so they get a charge put on them. So this can be two positive charges, or three, or four, or one positive charge. And of course, we do this to be able to have the, the, the thing fly through the mass spectrometry, right? Because 
they, it needs to be charged to be attracted or to be shot out. Um, and then we have the separation of the mass over charge, right? So we can do this using a sector instrument or a time of flight instrument. And then we have the detection. So the detection part is actually just generally a the 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 charged molecule molecule flying against the metal plate, and then this is detected um, using a computer. We also talked about CAG, so we talked about um, yeah, that CAG has pathway information and that it's based on kind of a um, input protein output. Right, so you have a metabolite and then a protein working on that metabolite, transforming it into another metabolite. Right, so it has these kind of compounds and reactions. Um, has, so they have genes and, and proteins in there, um, but the main selling point or the unique selling point about CAG is that it allows you to reason what type of metabolites an animal can make and which type of uh, metabolites the animal cannot make. We also have Reactome, which is a different database, which um, is very similar, right? It also contains pathway information. It also has many different organisms. Um, this one is open source. CAG actually has a paid version and also a free version. Um, but the difference between CAG and Reactome is that um, CAG is very much based in more or less chemistry, right? So we have a metabolite and a protein working on the metabolite, transforming it into something else, while Reactome is um, more um, holistic in a way, right? So they have a pathway for RNA um, or for RNA transcription or DNA duplication, right? So their, their, their pathways um, in Reactome are very similar to the pathways in CAG, um, but they look at a slightly higher level. So it's not metabolite, protein, metabolite. Um, it's, it's, it's more conceptual. We also talked about Cytoscape, um, one of these open source tools that allows you to visualize complex networks and integrate with any type of attribute data, which of course him, means that it's used a lot in bioinformatics to show like large gene networks or large protein net networks. Um, but it's also used in social network analysis, which means things like Facebook. Hey, you can use Cytoscape to visualize your friends and who are their friends and Hey, you can then use different attributes. So you can say, well, um, everyone living in Germany, color them green. Everyone living in, in Poland, color them blue and all of these things, right? So you can overlay all types of different data on top of your network. And that is why Cytoscape is really useful. Um, and we also have, it is also used a lot in the semantic web. Um, so hey, when websites are presented to you, it's just plain text. But you can use HTML tags to uh, HTML tags um, to kind of give meaning to um, parts of the text, right? So you can tell, for example, the search engine saying that um, Denny is a name, right? And it's a first name, while Arends is a family name. And then the search engine starts to understand what's going on and it can build up kind of an internal network saying that, okay, so hey, Danny Ahrens is a person and he works at this department. This department has other persons working there. And then it can kind of form a more comprehensive image on what is being displayed on a website. And this is called the semantic web or web 2.0, I think. And nowadays people are talking about web 4.0. I I got lost at web 3.0. Like for me, it's all HTML, CMS, and, and JavaScript. Um, but there's there's a, apparently a difference between the World Wide Web now and like 10 years ago. I think the main difference is just that the spying is increased a lot. So um, then we had lecture number seven, the introduction into R, and there will be no questions about this on the exam because this is just a lecture for you guys to show you guys that you should if you want to have a career in bioinformatics you should definitely pick up at least one data science programming language um, so hey it's really good to learn something like r or python um, which are more or less the two main um, languages that are being used in bioinformatics um, so but for you guys there will be no questions about this on the exam so that's good that means that you can just skip the lecture um, when you are learning for the exam. All right, and then we went all the way back, right? Because now we discussed all of the different biomolecular levels. We started off on the lowest level, which is the DNA, then the RNA, then the proteins, then the metabolites, right? And then we started, I, I started 
talking or the lecture eight was about phenotypes and how we do QTL mapping, right? So um, I talked to you about uh, the quantitative traits and the, uh, the EC, yeah, so a little bit of repeat of the first lecture. Uh, qualitative traits, which are more or less measured subjectively. I showed you this picture yeah, where we say that quantitative traits are a subset of all traits out there. So all traits out there are qualitative and quantitative together. Um, but of course, like quali uh, quantitative traits are a subset of the qualitative traits. And this subset is growing, right? The more machines we build, the better we are in kind of um, es expressing qualitative things into quantitative units. Right, so an example of this would be uh, the the taste or the quality of wine. Um, that used to be a very qualitative trade, right? You would have a panel of wine tasters. Everyone would would taste a glass, and then they would score the wine, saying this is a good or a bad wine. Um, but nowadays, you just have a robot that does that, right? So. It'll, couple of drops of the wine get put in the robot and the robot analyzes the composition of the wine and then just gives it its score. Um, so hey, quantitative is growing while qualitative is more or less shrinking. Um, and again I talked to you guys about Mendelian and complex phenotypes. So when we talk about uh, phenotypes and QTL mapping, um, I taught you guys about the crossover events, right? So that we have meiosis 1, meiosis 2 and that this whole thing works or this whole thing is um, that we can do things like um, associate a region of the genome with a certain phenotype or find a region of the genome where a phenotype is more or less controlled from. Um, and that is only possible because we have this chromosomal crossovers. Right, so that that in meiosis one, yeah, so what we get is we get duplication of the of the of the genomes that we have, and yeah, then we have the uh, homologous chromosomes, yeah, which are more or less bound together, and then we have this um, this crossover where parts of one chromosome are exchanged to the other one, right? And then of course we have the meiosis two, where now we go from having two copies of each chromosome uh, to having only a single copy of the chromosome, and then these are called generally gametes. So, and um, I also had two links there in the in the lecture, which are two um, more or less um, little movies where it is explained in much more detail and graphically, right? Because a, a movie can show you guys how this happens so that they align together and that they then get swapped around. Um, and that's very difficult to catch in a in a picture. So when we talked about QTL mapping, I told you guys that you can only do QTL, so quantitative trait locus analysis, when you uh, use an experimental cross, right? So you start off with, for example, two inbred founders who get crossed together. Then we get a, a generation which is called the F1 generation. And in the F1 generation, everyone has one chromosome from the father, one chromosome from the mother, right? And there's no, no crossover here or no recombination because of the fact that the parental line had two exactly identical chromosomes. So for the father it had two exactly identical chromosomes and for the mother the same thing. So had of course crossover occurred but this crossover had no effect. I think I even made a little drawing during the lecture showing how this works. Um, but I want you guys to know the advantages and disadvantages of the different types of crosses that we discussed. And so um, for example what a recombinant inbred line is. And so where you do this cross between the two founders and then create these functions funnels in which you within the funnel you start brother sister mating so to make sure that you get immortal animals um, which you can use forever and ever um, well they're not immortal but they're like clones right so a, a, a single real line so recombinant inbred line so one of these lines um, you can mate a male with a female and then the children of these uh, will be exactly identical yeah, but there are of course uh, problems there yeah, because if you have a recombinant inbred line then there's only two states so either being AA or BB um, so there are no heterozygote animals within the population and because there are no heterozygote animals in a recombinant inbred line you cannot estimate things like additive and dominance you can only see that there's a difference between the two homozygote groups but you get no information about the heterozygotes in the middle. 
Uh, the back cross is more or less the same thing, um, but the back cross is really quick to make because you cross two inbred animals, you get an F1 generation, and then this F1 generation is crossed back to one of the two uh, parentals. And then hey, we have the uh, uh, we have the advantage that it's really really quick to do because you only need two generations. Um, but the problem with a back cross is is that when you do the association, you get large parts of the genome which are associated and you have this imbalance between having only 25% AA and 75% BB and again because individuals are only um, AA or AB um, you get no information about dominance and additivity. Um, F2 cross more or less solves these things um, so it has the disadvantage of still having like large regions but it allows you to investigate additive and dominant effect. So QTL mapping, GWAS, we talked about the difference, we talked about how they are very similar, right? So there's, there's, they're both methods to find regions of the genome which control genes or which control phenotypes, right? And um, the, the difference is, is that in QTL mapping you are able to map between the markers because of the fact that you have a structured population while in a GWAS you just have an outbred population generally um, of humans and there of course you cannot know what is between the markers but in, a, in, a, in an F2 for example you can map in between the markers. And of course there's another big difference and that's the way how these results are displayed. So in a QTL you have a smooth line plot across the chromosome and in a genome-wide association you generally have the results presented to you as a Manhattan plot. Um, so at, during the lecture we saw uh, examples of that. I talked also about effect size versus likelihood, so that the effect size is the, the difference between the AA and the BB group, and that the likelihood is the statistical test when you compare individuals having AA versus individuals having BB. Um, and of course here we have to also think about multiple testing, um, but that came back I think in another lecture as well. So multiple testing is of course the issue is that when you do a lot of statistical tests, um, you have to kind of compensate for the fact that you did a lot of tests. Good. Um, so I've been talking for around an hour, so we'll do a quick break and then we will do the um, remaining five lectures and then go to the um, four example questions so that you guys have an idea of what I ask and when. Um, so let me set up not the audio but the music. Um, so yeah, I'll we'll be back in like 10 minutes and then we'll just continue with uh, discussing the different lectures. So five lectures left and then uh, then we're done so it's gonna be a very short lecture so I will see you guys in around 10 minutes um, if you're watching this on YouTube then um, probably see you tomorrow so bye bye for now <laughs>